Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 81, October 3rd to October 9th, 1862. Last week, we had a few scattered events, which included setting up better for next week, the climax of the Heartland Campaign with the Battle of Perryville. We had some action in Texas at Sabine Pass, and also the First Battle of Newtonia in Missouri. This week, we would have also returned to Texas, but we actually concluded that action in the previous episode as well. Before we get going, I do want to mention that should be posted to the Patreon feed. Did a little picture slideshow of some images, a uh, modern day battlefield at Antietam. I really couldn't resist posting some stuff from my record. So if you watched the P Ridge episode, that has a picture slideshow there, as well as the seven days slideshows that included Malvern Hill and Gaines's Mill. Um, it is very much the same ilk, uh, mostly monuments, but did get some good pictures with some topography and there that really gives you a good idea of the battlefield in general. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, that is once again on the Patreon feed and your support for the show is greatly appreciated. Let's go ahead and see what is going on in Mississippi. When we left off, we had just fought the Battle of Iuka. While it could certainly have gone better for Sterling Price and the Confederates, it definitely could also have been much worse. Price and his army had escaped and moved to join Vent Dorn. Remember that Grant was trying to catch Price in a pincer move, and he probably could have done so if Ord had moved when he was supposed to move. There was that little bit of miscommunication between that wing of the army and Rosecrans. You should recall when we talked about the Battle of Pea Ridge earlier this year that Sterling Price and Earl Van Dorn definitely have their differences, and that has continued here into October of 1862. Both of them wisely surmised, though, that they would stand a better chance together. But there would lie the problem, because Price would feel that Van Dorn was writing a check that he would have to cash. At the time, Van Dorn probably had a little over 7,000 men, while Price still had 14,000. Together, they had around 22,000 men, which still is going to make them around even with just Rosecrans. If Grant was able to marshal all his strength, then it would be difficult for the rebels. But Grant and his troops were all spread out covering the various parts of his department, and Grant himself had removed to St. Louis to confer with Samuel Curtis, officially, but really, he was not having the best of times in Mississippi. His wife Julia had left, and the situation with his military career had him depressed. Remember that Grant had been at odds with Halleck, and his assignment to this particular department was not too bad because it's not like he was under Halleck's thumb anymore, but he also felt that he was being relegated to a lesser part of the conflict. So as you can imagine, and it is very hard sometimes when we're studying history to realize that these are real people, Grant in his mind has won a great victory at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson that opened up further invasion of su several southern states. He also had what was overall a victory at the Battle of Shiloh. So those are two big W's in the column for 
the Federals. And now it is seeming like he is being shoved to the side and he might not get another chance, you know, hindsight 2020, of course, but he might not get another chance to really prove himself and prove himself to be a capable commander and really make an impact on the war. Now, leaving the department at that point was not necessarily wise, given that there were already reports that Price and Van Dorn had combined. Ulysses had told Halleck, not entirely truthfully, that everything was quiet. Still, Sherman, Ord, and Rosecrans divided up different areas, with Rosecrans receiving the task of holding Corinth. And it would be Corinth that Van Dorn would set his eyes on. Intelligence reported that Rosecrans had around 15,000 men at the city. A quick strike, he thought, would be able to take Corinth, force the Union forces to retreat, and allow for a joining of Bragg in Tennessee and Kentucky. Many of the officers were against this move, including Price and Mansfield Lovell. Lovell, if you recall, had been the defender of New Orleans, and had been blamed unfairly by Jefferson Davis for the loss of that city. They argued it was actually going to be wiser to wait for the recently exchanged prisoners who had arrived in Jackson a short time before. These men could have added another 10,000 or so to the command once fit, but Van Dorn was not satisfied with their timetable. Remember that quick action had been his undoing at Pea Ridge, so too would it be his undoing again at Corinth. So with this overall goal in mind, the Confederates would march. The strategy was that the rebels would lead the Union army into believing that they were heading to Tennessee before turning and moving on Corinth. Rosecrans was concerned about the potential Confederate movement. You see, Price had swung south, then west, to link up with Van Dorn. Ayuka, if you look on a map, is east of Corinth. Once at Camp Ripley, they had marched north toward the Tennessee line. This actually put them within eight or so miles of the city. From there, they would turn on the Federals and supposedly catch them unaware. Rosecrans, though, had concentrated his forces at the North Mississippi City. He had a strong suspicion that Corinth was the target of the rebel movement. Ironically, it might actually have been a better move for Van Dorn to continue into Tennessee, which may have forced the northern troops to change their base and maybe even withdraw to Columbus, Kentucky. There's always this weird fascination with Corinth, whether it was on the Union side or the Confederate side. Both armies really covet the city, but it is sometimes argued that it does sort of lack the strategic importance that is really emphasized, one, by Halleck's move earlier in the year, and then, of course, now this move by Van Dorn. Van Dorn was not a tactical mastermind, especially not with infantry, so he was dead set on the plan he already put in motion. Price would be questioned by Van Dorn as to his commitment to the plan, The Missouri General would respond that he would be the most eager on the field. Skirmishing would do little to assuage the nerves of Rosecrans. It could be a feint to draw them off target. It could be a prelude to very different things. Now, Rosecrans has units from the Army of Mississippi and units from the Army of West Tennessee. The Army of West Tennessee had a division commanded by Thomas Davies and one by Thomas McKean. Davies was a New York native and a career soldier who had served on the frontier. He was a good choice to lead a division. Davies actually had a nephew also serving as a general in the Union Army. McKean had yet to see a field command during the war so in some ways, he was not as good a choice. 
the Pennsylvania native, had served in the Mexican-American War as an enlisted man. After the war, he would benefit from being a member of the Republican Party. McKean's division would be commanded by the Scot John MacArthur. He was acceptable considering McKean's limited ability. Now, we've actually met MacArthur before. If you recall, he does good service at Fort Donelson and saw further action at Shiloh. Brigades between the two divisions would be commanded by Richard Oglesby, Pleasant Hackleman, John Oliver, and Marcellus Crocker, amongst others. Oglesby was an intimate of Abraham Lincoln. He has already been in our story, serving under McClernand during the Fort Donelson campaign. He will go on to Corps Command before the end of the war. Hackleman was a lawyer before the war and had been a part of the peace conference we talked about that tried to find an alternative to violence. John Oliver was a pharmacist before the hostilities. He would go on to serve throughout the campaigns in the West, eventually going on to practice law in Little Rock. Crocker was an Iowa native, already having commanded a regiment at Shiloh. He will go on to a division command under McPherson, but will die as a result of complications from TB in 1865. Rosecrans had a grand plan to draw a potential Confederate attack using these forces. He would set up in the original Confederate earthworks. Additional earthworks in the form of lunettes and other positions would be ready to receive the enemy once they were drawn in. Rosecrans, of course, did not want to bring on a general engagement, which would be an issue on the first day of fighting. Van Doren's army would set up with Lovell's and Dabney's divisions in the lead, with Hebert's battered men in reserve. Murray had under him John C. Moore and William Cable, among others. John Creed Moore had served in the army prior and fought in Florida against the Seminole. He will go on to command in the West under Bragg, but will resign before the end of the war. Cable was a Virginia native who will be captured during Price's Missouri Raid in 1863 and practice law after the war. October 3rd would see these men, amongst others, in position and ready for an assault. Rosecrans was aware that Confederate spies had indicated the weakest point in his line was from the north. This would be where he would focus on bolstering the defensive effort. Federal forces under Oliver would advance to potentially meet the southern threat. This position would be known as Oliver's Hill. It was a strong point, actually maybe stronger than the old Confederate earthworks, that the men from the Division of Davies had occupied. This would be a cross from Price's men. MacArthur, luckily for the Union cause, did not have a command and would take over for McKean, as we mentioned. He would agree that the hill was where Oliver should make his stand, the regiment and artillery facing Lovell as he moved from the northwest. Price was moving down on Davies from a relative northerly route. Lovell's men would engage Oliver and drive him from the hill. Casualties were suffered on both sides. Artillery and rifle fire wreaked havoc on the lead brigade of Albert Rust, his Alabama, Arkansas, and Kentucky troops leading the way. Another Confederate unit worth mentioning was Carruthers Mississippi Sharpshooters of Bowen's Brigade. This unit was recently formed and well-drilled, expected to act as a modern form of light infantry, or maybe the antiquated equivalent of Pathfinders. They would perform well in the taking of Oliver's Hill, inflicting many blue cad casualties. Particularly, the 14th Wisconsin suffered the loss of their color guard and almost lost their colors. It was saved by a member of the 15th Michigan, who had broken at the onslaught of gray-clad enemies. 
Oliver's men were successfully pushed off the hill, and if Lovell wanted to, he could have exploited the left flank of Davy's division. But instead, he decided to stop and collect his men. This could have caused a cascade of Union retreats that may have foiled the attempt to spring a trap. In front of Lovell was a line of abattis, which the Confederate general considered to be a strong position, too strong for his men to attack. In reality, given the defenders, he might have taken this position easily. On the northern sector, men were occupying the earthworks the Confederates had built earlier in the year. In fact, it was very possible Van Dorn's army had taken an active part in building them once they had arrived from Arkansas. Price would push Mari's division to take the earthworks, which they did, facing a small brigade from Richard Oglesby. Men from the two Ohio and two Illinois regiments, one made up mostly of German volunteers, would break and run. Price's men would capture one camp the Federals had previously inhabited. Much like Shiloh, the rebels would stop to plunder the enemy wares. They were hungry, not having eaten anything that day. Temperatures on the 3rd were already at 90 degrees in the morning, showing the difficult atmosphere the soldiers fought in. Crocker led his Iowa Brigade in relief, which some considered one of the better brigades in the Trans-Mississippi. They were unable to pause the attack from the rebels, falling back to the main federal lines. Another camp fell into southern possession, which was enough for the Confederates for the time being. Davies had retreated to the final line of defense at Battery Robinette. This was also known as the White House Line, and it was a good position. There were several hundred yards of open field in which the Confederates would have to assault, and in the extreme heat. This actually would affect the Federals as well, though. One Ohio regiment had more than two times the number of men fall out in the retrograde to the heat exhaustion than they did in the initial assault by Price's men. Artillery would fire before Martin Green's brigade attacked the line. They would fire over the heads of the Union forces, who would then level heavy musket fire in return, breaking the momentum. Dispersing amongst cover, it broke down to trading volleys and shots at one another. Davies and his regiments would run low on ammunition. A counterattack would be short-lived. Richard Oglesby would be wounded, as would Pleasant Hackleman, the latter's proving mortal. Now Davies had begged to be reinforced, and Rosecrans would oblige in the form of Mauer's brigade, which had marched impressively to make it to the field in time. Rosecrans would place some blame on Davies for withdrawing from his positions, but given the circumstances, it's hard to really lay that blame too heavily upon him. Mauer's brigade, unfortunately, would not perform well. One regiment broke immediately, probably due to exhaustion. Even the 8th Wisconsin did not stand against the Confederate attacks. Their mascot, the Eagle Old Abe, reportedly flew to the ground and did not wish to be brought into the fight. Even with pushing back the federal forces, there was not an advantage pressed with darkness setting in on the field. During the fighting, Charles Hamilton was ordered to attack the open flank of the oncoming rebels, but would miss his chance in dense forested terrain. Faced with enemy skirmishers, he believed to be the advance of the Confederate assault. He would not exploit this weakness. You see, Hamilton and his men were in their line further to the north. They would not see a major assault, so they could have removed themselves from their line and hit the Confederates as they pushed to the city. To be fair to Hamilton, there were orders that were kind of confusing from Rosecrans, I have seen it implied that Rosecrans had a nervous or excited stutter that caused him to blurt out and contradict his orders. 
there were some rumblings of a potential night assault, which would have been most likely a disaster. While there would be no attack, there was some shuffling that would support Rosecrans in his sporadic nature. Davies and his exhausted men had been removed from the front line, although they were ousted from their sleep and shifted back to some of the ground they had already fought over. Rosecrans would then have Fuller and Stanley's men to the west, while Hamilton and Davies were more to the north. Earl Van Dorn was also thinking of maybe trying something in the darkness, and certainly maybe have been supported by Lovell's subordinate generals, wishing to make up for leaving Price's men to continue the battle the majority of the day. As we have mentioned, night assaults were tricky. For this, both sides would come to the conclusion they had won the first day. It would be decided on the 4th who was correct. Van Dorn's attack plan for the 4th was fairly simple. Price and his contingent would push on the Union line roughly from Battery Robinette to Battery Powell. Lovell would put pressure on Stanley's men between Battery Phillips and Battery Williams. This combined effort would break the Union line and give the Confederates the town of Corinth. Unfortunately for Van Dorn, Louis Hebert would report as sick on the morning of the 4th. Martin Green would take over command of the division, but it was unclear to the rest of the officers what the plan of attack exactly was. Because of this, there would be limited support for any kind of breakthrough. In fact, Cable's brigade would remain in the rear when a breakthrough occurs instead of being thrown into the fight for much-needed support. To be fair, Price and Van Dorn also do not do a good job of troop disposition. Likewise, Van Dorn tells Lovell to use caution and attack only when he hears the assault from Green and Mowry. Price's men would lead the assault, and they would immediately suffer heavy casualties when marching at the Union works. I have a quote from a Confederate private in Price's command who participated in the first assaults that is, fairly gripping in realism. Death came in a hundred shapes, every shape a separate horror. Here a shell, exploding in the thinning ranks, would render its victims and spatter their comrades with brains, flesh, and blood. Men's heads were blown to atoms. Fragments of human flesh still quivering with life would slap other men in the face or fall to earth to be trampled underfoot. There were other quotes, many of which were extremely graphic like this one. The savagery of the battle is really portrayed, and although there were bigger battles, this one does well to illustrate the brutality of combat. On a personal note, I will say, when you research this kind of stuff, you do get a lot of quotes, um, but in this particular instance, you know, maybe it was just having gone through Antietam and starting up on Perryville, but I had some of these quotes and, uh, actually put the book down and uh, had to take a break after reading some of this stuff. So really gives you an idea of the kinds of horrors that these average men, you know, went through. And it's almost like the opening scene of, of Saving Private Ryan almost, like just in the amount of, you know, retellings that are, that are fairly graphic like this. So it definitely puts everything in perspective for you when you read about this kind of stuff. Now, what does help the Confederates is that the Federals had thrown out skirmishers. So while the skirmishers are retreating back to friendly lines, the artillery and infantry cannot fire into the attacking gray and butternut lines. Fortunately also for the brigade under John H. Moore, they would be hitting the already weakened and exhausted division under Davies. Davies would be able to reform his men and counterattack because the rebel line had faltered without support to carry the day. Moore's men actually did get into the town, not too far from the Tishomingo Hotel. There would be house-to-house fighting in Corinth. At this point, Rosecrans would actually believe the battle was a defeat despairing to a staff officer that the day was lost. 
the timely reform and counterattack would save the Federals. Moore would be mortally wounded during the fighting, his men actually using Federal horses to escape. Elsewhere during the assault, Confederate regiments were subject to heavy fire from their flanks as Union troops down the line were able to hit them. Further to the north, Colbert's Confederates would hit Napoleon Buford's division. Amongst Buford's men are the 11th Ohio. They would spy some of the men who had helped to capture their guns at Iuka. Vowing there would be no repeat of that battle, the 11th would get their revenge, and with the help of their infantry supports, turn back the Confederates, repulsing any move on the Union right flank. Mowry's men hit Fuller's brigade near Battery Robernet in the relative Union center. Mowry's brigades under Pfeiffer and John C. Moore would be badly torn up in the assault, which was captured in the famous lithograph showing the 63rd Ohio, one of Fuller's regiments, turning back the rebel attack. William Rogers of Moore's brigade, the commander of the 2nd Texas, would be instrumental in this part of the field, but the rebels would face a counterattack from Union troops, which included the 11th Missouri. Mowry's men would suffer many killed and wounded, and a large amount of men captured, cutting his division almost in half. Rogers would attempt to surrender, but in the smoke and confusion would be gunned down instead, showing the fierce fighting in this sector as well. I mentioned Rogers because there is a photo of Confederate dead following the battle, and the colonel's body is actually believed to be identified as one of them in the picture. Mowry's men would have benefited greatly from the help in the form of Mansfield Lovell's men, but they would remain idle for the second day. Lovell would be heavily blamed by the men of the army for the failure of the attack on the 4th. In reality, though, Lovell's men would probably have met the same fate as Price's division. Having been treated roughly, the Confederate army would withdraw. Rosecrans would be content to let his men recover. It was another hot Mississippi day, and the troops on both sides were lacking in food and water. After Corinth, Van Dorn was in need of a reality check. The Mississippi general wished to continue the assault, marching around the Union forces and hitting the city from the rear. A council of war, which included much of the talking done by Price, would make the commanding officer realize that further offensive action would not be possible. Ord's federal forces were on the way to cut him off, and Rosecrans began the pursuit on the 5th. It was no longer about achieving glory through a grand strike. It would be about saving his army. The problem would be crossing the Hatchie River. Ord, with Hurlbut's division leading the way, would be barreling down toward the crossing. In fact, there had already been hot contests between the respective cavalry forces. Van Dorn had erred greatly in his troop placement on the retreat. Lovell's relatively fresh division was kept in the rear, or Maori's heavily depleted division would be in the lead. It would be these lead units who would meet Hurlbut's men on October 5th. The northern troops were holding a crossing of the Hatchie at the Davis Mill, which of course had the Davis Bridge. Ord would be wounded during the action, with Hurlbut taking over command on the field. There was not a whole lot of fight left in the Confederates, though. Maury's men melted away, with many being captured. Luckily for the Confederates, there was a strong artillery position, supported by Cable's brigade, on their side of the Hatchie. Hurlbut's men would take heavy casualties and be successfully repulsed by Price. The attack was not pressed, Hurlbut reportedly being intoxicated during the fight. Confederate cavalry would find an alternative crossing, allowing for them to get away from the converging Union forces. Ord and Rosecrans had failed to act in concert, which was something requested specifically by Grant. So, we can draw Corinth to a close. The Confederates had suffered heavily, with 4,800 casualties 
which was some 20 or so percent, compared to 2,359 for the Federals. Despite losing less, this was still one out of every 10 men engaged. At Davis Bridge, there were additionally 500 Union and 400 Confederate losses. We can ask ourselves exactly what the significance of the battle was. Reinforcements still made it to Buell, and Van Dorn and his army would not be joining any kind of joint invasion of the North. Even if the attacks at Corinth had been successful, Grant could have massed more men to outnumber the Confederates. This would have definitely led to probably the city being abandoned anyway. Van Dorn would be relegated to subordinate command to John C. Pemberton, and Price would shift to the Trans-Mississippi under Kirby Smith. Actually, there would be a court of inquiry brought against Van Dorn for his conduct during the campaign. It was asserted by some officers, most notably John Bowen, that Van Dorn had faulty intelligence and was operating off crude and inaccurate maps. He would be cleared of any charges against him, but would still do nothing to revive his damaged reputation. It would be this defeat at Corinth that would convince Braxton Bragg to withdraw from Kentucky after Perryville, which we will talk about next week. Rosecrans is going to continue to bump heads with Grant. When the Ohio native was destined for promotion, Grant did very little to stop his move. In fact, we can be critical of Grant for this campaign, just as a side note. There's not really an organized pursuit of the enemy. Grant does make an excuse and prod Halleck to give him definite orders to move after Van Dorn, a commitment Halleck would not make. It would seem that Grant had learned how to play the game. But of all the campaigns that Grant wages, and granted he does not take an active part in this one, it is very easy to see this one as probably his worst. Even though it does end out to be a good result for the northern forces, he's very lethargic and really doesn't have a whole lot of enthusiasm in the operation in general. So it's not necessarily a black mark on his record, but it's definitely uh, probably on the lower end of the campaigns that Grant wages. It is going to start to set up well for Grant's Vicksburg campaigns, and believe it or not, we're actually going to get to those fairly soon. Let's pause there. We fought the Second Battle of Corinth today, which, at least in our narrative, is now the second repulse of a Confederate offensive in the fall of 1862. Next week, we're going to hit the trifecta. Next week, we will talk about the Battle of Perryville. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns... The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.